My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 100 and 57 day I don't know why it says 58 here yes it is 158 day 3158 3 is to signify the fact that we are in the third edition third edition day 158 we are in the process of solving the problems from the practice test that you find at the, at the end of the book second practice test on page number 487 is where we are problem number 22 is what we're going to work on make sure the book is in front of you Turn to page number 487 and read the problem to yourself. Number 22. It says the operation and they use the symbol add. Actually, actually in the book they use this symbol. With the, this symbol is what they use in the book. I prefer to use this one because it's quicker to write. You understand? So whenever we see this symbol, they say that this symbol it means this operation is defined for all integers. They have to be all integers, all numbers, x and y, such that Whenever we see this symbol between x and y, we have, we have to take, we have to multiply, we have to take the product of whatever we see on the left hand side times whatever we see on the right hand side of the symbol and then subtract from it, subtract from it, subtract from this product of left and right, subtract from it whatever we see on the right hand side. That's what that is. So x operation y means x times y minus y. They go on to say, if x and y are both positive integers, they have to be both positive. That's the condition we have to fulfill, that they must be both positive integers. In that case, which of the following cannot be zero? Which of the following cannot be zero? In other words, they give us five answer choices. Turns out that four of those five answer choices will turn to zero. This quantity will turn to zero in some cases. Our job to find one instance where it will never turn to zero. Let's take a look at it. Which of the following? cannot be zero. Let's take an answer choice A. Answer choice A, answer choice A is exactly what is given to us. So x operation y is simply x times y minus y. If we take out the y common, if we take out the y common, what we left here is x minus one. Yes or no? Now we can clearly see that here, we can clearly see that here, when x is equal to one, when x is equal to one, this whole quantity, this whole quantity, let's call it Q for quantity. When x is equal to 1, when put in here 1 minus 1 is 0, it doesn't matter what y is. When x is equal to 1, it, 1 minus 1 is 0, it doesn't matter at that point what y is. When x is equal to 1, this whole quantity will be 0. And our job is to find an instance where it cannot be 0. So A is not the answer. A, A tells us that the qu given quantity will become 0 if it turns out that x is equal to negative 1. Let's take a look at B. In B, they switch the they switch the the they switch the the order instead of x operation y now is y operation x. This is answer choice B. Again, same thing. So instead of x times y, it's going to be now y times x, which really doesn't change anything because it's still the same. But instead of minus y, wherever, wherever we see x, we, have, we replace it with y. This means that wherever we see x, we replace it with y, which is why in place of x, we wrote down y. In place of y, we put down x minus original quantity was y, we replace it with x. Again, if we take the x common, we'll end up with y minus 1. And here we can see... Here we can see that when y is equal to 1, before when x was equal to 1, the quantity was 0. Here when y is equal to 1, the quantity will become 0. When y is equal to 1. And it cannot be 0. It cannot be 0. We're looking for a situation when it can never be 0. So b is not the answer choice. Let's look at c. Answer choice c says, x minus 1 operation y x minus 1 operation y. So we're going to do the same thing as before. Whatever we see x this time, whatever we see x this time in this, in this original thing, we're going to replace it with x minus 1. Do you understand? 
So let's let's put the original one first, so we can line it up. Originally, we are given this x operation y is equal to x times y minus y. So in C, we have x minus one, x minus one operation y. So it's sort of x times y is going to be x minus one times y minus y. You with me? As we open the parenthesis, as we open this parenthesis, we get we're going to get x times y minus y and then another y. So far so good. Let's combine the y's together. This y came down. So we have x minus y, x x times y minus 2y. So so far so good. Very good. Let's take out the the term that is common, the term that is common, uh, the quantity that is common among, among these among these two terms, between these two terms is y. Let's take it out common. If we take out y common, we end up here with x minus 2. What does that tell us? That tells us that here, here, when x is equal to 2, the quantity will become 0. And, and we are fulfilling the condition. The only condition that we have to fulfill is that they both have to be integers. And they both have to be positive. It is positive. We are not violating. X is positive, and X is a whole number. It's a positive whole number. But the problem is that when it takes on the value of two, the quantity will become zero. This quantity, which is what we're calling Q, will become zero. It is not allowed to be zero. The question: Which of the following cannot be zero? So C is doesn't work. C is not going to work. Let's look at D. What does D say? So again, what we're given here is this, x operation y is x times y minus y, that's what we have. And here, we have x plus 1. So same as before, wherever we see x, we're going to replace it with x plus 1 and see what happens. So x will become x plus 1 times y minus y. Let's open the parenthesis. Let's open the parenthesis. When we open the parenthesis, we're going to get x times y, and then plus plus 1 times y is going to give us plus y and minus y. Plus y and minus y, they will kill each other, and we're left with x times y. What do we conclude from here? But since, since we are told, let's put it here so I have one more line to write, so I don't have to go too low. Since, since, we are told that that both x and y are positive integers, x and y are positive integers. Since we are told that right here, x and y are both positive integers, we are told that therefore their product their product will never be zero. Their product will never be zero. Their product cannot be zero. Their product, we can say, will never be zero, or their product, as they put it, can not be zero. Which is, which is how they phrase it. Which of the following cannot be zero? The answer is this quantity here x plus 1 operation y, this quantity that we have here, will never be 0, because these are both positive integers. If you take two positive integers, 3 times 7, 3 times 5, 3 times 7, 4 times 38, 22 times 30, 38 million, it doesn't matter. If you take any two positive integers, and if you multiply them together, how in the world are we going to get a 0 out of it? They, their product will never be 0. There we go, we found the answer. The answer is D. The correct answer is D. Even though we found the answer, the answer is D. Even though we found the answer, let's just quickly see why E does not work, shall we? Let's quickly see why E does not work. E says, E says, again, let's first write down what we have. X operation Y, we are told, S to equal X times Y minus Y. And here we have x operation y minus 1. So we have, to, we have to replace y with y minus 1. So let's see what happens. 
So it will become x times y, which will become y minus 1, minus y. Let's see what we can do. I'm going to erase all of this thing from the previous one. Remember, we already found the answer. The answer is d. Paul, what do you notice here? Do you notice anything here? Oh, sorry, this is wrong. What is wrong with this thing? Can you figure out what's wrong with here? We have to replace y with y minus 1. Well, I did it here, but I forgot to do it there. That's not a y, that's y minus 1. So do you notice between these two quantities, this quantity right here and that quantity right here, do you find anything peculiar, anything, anything noticeable? What we find is that in this quantity and that quantity, y minus 1 is common. y minus 1 is common. We can take it out. We can take it out as a common factor. We can take it out as a common factor. What's the coefficient of this quantity right here, y minus What's the coefficient here? The coefficient is 1, even though it does not say it, but it's there. The coefficient is 1. It's 1 times that. So let's take out this y minus 1 common. Let's take it out common. y minus 1 common. And if we take it out common, what are we left? To, what are we left with the first quantity? From the first quantity, we're just left with x. And when we and here then we have minus. And from here, when we take out y minus 1 common, what we're left here with is 1. So what we conclude? It turns out that here, here, the quantity, the given quantity that is, the, the given quantity which is what we're calling Q, but when we replace, when this operation we do, this given quantity that we see here, this thing right here which boils down to this, this given quantity turns out will equal, equal to zero when either, either X or Y equals zero. No, not zero. Not zero when either x or y equal 1. What happens when y is 1? When y is equal to 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. And 0 times anything is 0. It doesn't matter at that point what x is. But as long as y takes the value of 1, this quantity, this quantity q, will become 0. Similarly, when x is equal to 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, this quantity will become 0. It doesn't matter at that point what y is, the product will be 0. So this given quantity will equal 0 when either x or y or both of them are 0, uh, both of them are 1. But either x or y are equal, equal 1, the quantity will become 0, which we cannot have. The question was which of the following cannot be 0. The only quantity among the 5 that we found which can never ever be 0 is the quantity that we found in D, which after doing all the cooking we found it boils down to x times y. And how can, how can x times y how can x times y ever be 0, given the fact that both x and y are positive integers? It's not possible. It is impossible. If you're interested, I'll give you a percentile about, about uh, three-fifths of the people actually had trouble with it. About 60% of the people missed it. Only 42% of the people got it right. Let's do number 23. Let's do number 23. Number 23 requires a lot of Number 23 requires a lot of writing. You just have to be patient because without without the problem in front of us, I don't like I don't like to read the problem from the book and just solve it. Do you understand? So 23 says 23 says P Q point P Q and R are three points three points in a plane. Three points in a plane. What does it mean? Three points in a plane simply means that you just throw, you just put three points. Three points anywhere you like. Here is one point, here is another point, here is another point. These are three points here. They are in a plane. In other words, none of these two, three points are sticking out. They are sitting in a plane. And we are told that R does not lie on line PQ. R does not lie on line PQ. We're done with all of this thing. We don't need it. Let's erase it. So first statement that tells us that we have three points lying in a plane. <coughs> well, if we have three points lying in a plane, we could possibly have something like this. P, Q, and R. P, Q, and R. There are three points lying in a plane, but they have ruled out this possibility because they tell us R does not lie on PQ. 
or technically this would have been Q and the R would have been here. But that that possible actually the other way well anyway, this this they ruled out this possibility. The question simply is which of the following which of the following is true about the set of all points that are equidistant from all three points. The reason I do the, all this much explaining is because uh, as, I, as I begin to explain I quickly take a, a glance at the percentile and if a large percent of your percentage of the people got this question wrong then I figure it, it justifies a little bit more explanation even though even though at the very end you will see that there is not much in this problem if, if somebody who understands it there is not much going on here let's, let's, let's start the work shall we first understand let's make sure that first we understand the problem that's the important part so we have three points they're lying in a plane so let's draw three points lying in a plane one two and three but it says that R does not lie with PQ, so we cannot have P and Q and R and something like this. We can't have this. But there is nothing, there is nothing that prevents us to do, uh, put P, uh, Q and R. P, Q and R. Would that work? Well, they go on to say, but well, that would work. There are three points in a plane. Which we, we have three points in a plane. R does not lie on P to Q because if you draw the P to Q, R definitely does not lie on that line. So this would work. But then the question is, then the question is, which of the following is true about the set of all points that are equidistant from all three points? So here we have to find one point which is going to be equidistant, which is going to be a, which is going to be very difficult. I'm looking for my cap here before it dries, so I want to change the color. You see? Try to understand it. The point that is equidistant from P and Q will be the midpoint. Will be the midpoint. But you can clearly see distance from here to here is same as the distance from distance from here to here, but that distance is very different. Let's call it d1, d2, and d3. And what we are looking for is the situations where d1, where distance d1 equals d2, which is true here if you put it right in the middle, but the distance d3 is not equal. We're looking for set of all solutions. Set of all solutions means all possibilities where these three points that are given to us, P, Q, and R, are equidistant. Let's take a look at it. How can we possibly show a situation where all of these three points, P, Q, R, are equidistant? Well, perhaps something like this. P, Q, and R. Let's say P, Q, and R. And let's put a point, some and, and the only and the only way this can be possible is with this situation right here. This distance, let's let's start with P. Let's call let's call D1. D1 here is equal to D2, and that is equal to D3. There is a possible that's that's the possibility where three points P, Q, R lie in a plane. R does not lie on the same line that will join that will join P to Q if we were to make a straight line. And here we have situations where distance P to this point, D1 is equal to D2 is equal to D3. Here, here, D1 is equal to D2, but D3. But the point here is that that is the only possibility. That is the only possibility. This, this is the only way we can have a situation where these three points P, Q, and R are going to be equidistant. And therefore, and therefore, the solution set here the solution set, even though they call it set, the solution here, set here contains only one point. Let's call it let's call it C. And you will see why we call it C in a second. It contains only one point. Even though they call it set, it sounds like it has uh, quite a few members, quite a few elements in this sets, quite a few members in this set, but this set contains only one set. That's the only way. Do you, do you, are you able to see what it is that we're dealing with here? What does C represent? There is a reason why we call it C. Can you see it? What C is in fact is this. What C is in fact is this. Oh, 
What do you think C is? C represents the center of a circle. C here, let's put it on the top. Our solution set here. Our solution set, even though we call it solution set, sounds like there are too many, but it only has one member, one solution. Our solution set is simply, is simply the center of a circle where P, Q and R are on the circle. Let's continue writing. Our, our solution set our solution set is not is not is not the circle itself. It's not the circle itself. If you were to say, if we were to say, I don't want to erase this part because we need it. If you were to say that our solution set is a circle itself, here's a circle. Here's a circle, point, point P, point Q, and point P, Q, and R. Solution set is not a circle itself because if that were the case, then you can clearly see the distance from P to Q is not the same as distance from P to R. They have to be equidistant. So all the points in the circle are not our solution set. Our solution set is the center. It is the center of the circle because that's the only way, that's the only way we can have three points. Here's our circle. And here, once we, once we said this is our solution set, center C. And once we, show, once we understand that part, then we also understand that it doesn't matter where we put P, Q and R. It doesn't matter. As long as they are on the circle, they are all going to be equidistant because this represents the radius. The distance from, from this solution set to the point P to the point Q, it doesn't matter whether they are two very close to each other and while the other one is way over there. There is, a, there is a situation where we have shown that distance D1, which is Q to C, is same as the distance D2. Actually, this P should have been D1, this is D2, and this distance D3, they are all equal. But as you can see, they are sitting in a very strange way. Just because distance from P, Q, distance from P to the solution set is the same distance as distance from Q to solution set and, Q, and, and, and R to solution set, that does not mean that they are themselves equidistant from each other. Here it looks like they are because that's the way I drew it, because it looks like this distance is the same as that distance, but this distance, but it doesn't have to be. It did not have to be. We could have drawn, we could have drawn our circle. Now that we're done with this thing, let's erase this thing so we can write a proper, draw a proper circle. We could have drawn our, our circle. If I can do a little bit of a better job. Here's our circle. This is a solution set. And P, Q, and R can be anywhere. Here is P, here is, here is Q, and here is uh, anywhere you like. Here is R. And these distances are the same. P, Q, and R from P to the solution set D1 is same as a D2, is same as D3. But we can clearly see that does not mean that the distance that that does not mean the distance to, from P to Q is same as the distance from P to R and is same as distance from as you can these three distances, let's call them L1, L2 and L3. That does not have to be the same. People misunderstood the people who missed it, they probably misunderstood the question. Here you can clearly see that L1 does not have to equal to L2 and that does not have to equal to L3. They can be anywhere on the circle. They can be next but right next to each other, right next to each other, and it would work. If they are right next to each other, then you can clearly see the distance from P to Q is same as distance from Q to R, but distance from P to R is not going to be the same. You get the idea. I'm, I'm beating the dead horse at this point. The answer here is the solution set contains only one, one point. Solution set, we already wrote it. Solution set contains only one point. Solution set contains only one point, only one point, namely, namely the center of the circle. Even though the question does not require us to 
show this understanding, but that's what it is. It's the center of the circle. And the answer is B. Let me quickly check here. This was number 23. Number 23, it contains one point. That's right. Answer is, answer is B. I'm looking at the, here. And that was it. If you're interested, again, as always, the percentile, it was 41%. Again, just like the previous question, again, approximately three-fifths of the people who took the exam had trouble with it. They had trouble with it because they do not take their time to understand the question properly. The wording is very important. You must take your time to understand it because it's written in a way that's not always the language that we use in our daily life, obviously. Do you understand? I'll meet you tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll do question number 24, the penultimate question, and then which is day 50, 159, and then one, day 160. The day after tomorrow we'll finish this particular section of test number 2. Do you understand? Bye now.